Good morning, uh, good afternoon, evening, uh, whenever that you are watching this uh, broadcast. Uh, we're happy that you're doing so. My name is Colin Makemson, and I'm joined today by my colleague uh, Rob Wallace. And we are happy you've been able to join us today for this webinar uh, looking at um, the current special exhibit that's here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, focusing on trench art. That is uh, handmade things uh, from <coughs> World War II. Uh, we'll be talking and looking at some things from the exhibit, some really cool stuff that we have down uh, in our Senator John Alario Jr. Special Exhibition Hall right now at the museum. And that exhibit is up through January 2nd of 2022. So hopefully uh, if you're in and around, you'll get a chance to see these cool artifacts in person. If not, we'll give you uh, a good preview of some of the some of the highlights from that exhibit. Uh, but before we go too much further, I do want to remind everyone tuning in that this is a webinar. Neither uh, Rob and I are very happy you're here. Uh, we can't see you. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions for Rob or myself during the course of our webinar and our uh, time together today, you can place those in the Q&A function um, of the Zoom webinar, and we'll be able to read those and answer those that we have uh, as much time for today. This webinar is also being recorded, so if you can't catch us on the live broadcast, we're happy you're catching us uh, on a rerun uh, uh, or the, the rebroadcast. Uh, also, uh, handouts showing uh, the way you can go about uh, recreating these activities in your classroom or uh, in your kitchen table or with uh, your, 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 your friends and family will be added to the YouTube page when it is uploaded. Uh, so you'll be able to recreate some of these activities uh, at home. But uh, Rob, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, and want to see if you could ask if you could show us some of the highlights that you've selected from the exhibit that's right below yeah. us in the Hall of Democracy right downstairs. Yeah, so these were things that soldiers made and uh, while they were you know, had time in between things in the war and you know if you have a relative who's been in the military they'll tell you that <laughs> there's there are some terrifying times and then there are a lot of waiting around for things a lot of hurry up and wait I yeah think is a, a favorite term yeah. or a famous even if term. you're yeah there's time um you know especially if you're stationed on a, maybe a little island in the middle of pacific <laughs> It's like, you know, there's times when you're on duty and then there's times where there's not much else to do. And so what they would do is they would take stuff that was around that they could find. It wasn't stuff that they ordered. There was no Amazon back then to deliver to them. So it was just stuff they had around and using tools they had around to make things. Now, some of these guys were uh, prisoners of war. And so they had even more restrictive conditions about what they had. So they... These are some planes made out of plexiglass, and these guys were mechanics that worked on planes. Mm -hmm. And so they had ex access to spare cut pieces of plexiglass, and they made some cool planes out of plexiglass here. That's part of the exhibit. Another part is these metal planes. So they also were working on you know, building uh, parts and repairing planes. A lot of times the planes would get shot, and they had to put sheet metal back up. So they used some of the metal and some bullets to make uh, different models of planes. This is uh, jewelry. There's a lot of jewelry in the exhibit. Um, and they made it either for themselves or to send back home to mom or uh, girlfriend or something like that. Um, lots of cool jewelry. See lots of bracelets here. A lot of them are made out of aluminum. There was a lot of extra aluminum and they'd etch things into it and shape it. And, uh, and, and trench art too, Rob. Rob, this, this, uh, we're talking about trench art from World War II, but trench art itself, it, it's not unique to World War II or it's not a, it's not a, it's not a new concept, right? No, it's, it's been around for a long time. I mean, soldiers, uh, w most famously, like when they found uh, the Rosetta Stone, when Napoleon's folks found the Rosetta Stone in Egypt, they found uh, graffiti on the monument from Roman soldiers who had occupied it, you know, hundreds of years before. So the idea of trench art, uh, we're looking at some pretty old stuff from 75, 80 years ago from World War II of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, you know, 
putting some time they had, uh, 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 some downtime using some materials they found in hand. But yeah, this is not a new concept. Uh, mm -hmm. Soldiers have been using and creating trench art ever since there have been soldiers on battlefields. Uh, and the name itself uh, originates not from World War II, but World War I, mm -hmm. where famously um, uh, allied and uh, uh, central powers, uh, tr uh, troops faced each other in Europe while sheltering in trenches. Yep. Uh, so that's where it kind of gets the name and trench art now has become kind of a catch all term for anything uh, someone in the military puts their hands to, or I guess today puts, you know, machine tools to, to make something, uh, to pass the time, to tell about the time that they're experiencing or to bring back to a friend, family or loved one. And so these artifacts are really cool because they tell us something about the, the men who made them. They're mostly men who made them because uh, most of the people deployed in World War II were men. Uh, tells us about where they were, mm -hmm. tells us about what tools they had and what materials they had. So it's, so it's a really interesting combination of history, art, and science, engineering all together. So oh, we design, call this, all sorts of yeah, stuff. so we call this STEAM, but we could call it STEAM because it has an H in there. I don't know. Doesn't anyway, let's just call it cool stuff. <laughs> um, and I think my favorite part of the exhibit is, is this. And so there was a guy, he was, uh, he got shot down in, from a B-24. And so that plane on the right is a model of a B-24 that he made out of wood. Um, and he was a German prisoner of war. And he also took scraps of wood and, you know, pieces of things. Apparently he peeled glue from under the tables mm -hmm. in the mess hall uh, where they ate and other things. And he made this violin. Um, and he apparently played it mm -hmm. right before they were released in 1944. So, um, so I, to me, that's my favorite yeah. part. That's well, beautiful. Yeah, Claire Klein, who who made this uh, violin, like Rob said, while well, uh, he was a prisoner uh, of war, uh, so he's being held. Uh, he can't move around a lot. Doesn't have probably a whole lot to eat. Probably less to work with uh, yeah. than some of those. Uh, uh, people who made those models of planes and those rings and bracelets and pieces of jewelry. But yeah. just based on the amount of time he had um, and the determination to make something beautiful, he made this 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 functional violin that, like yeah. Rob said, plays and sounds uh, really, really beautiful. But yeah. They certainly did not let him have a carving knife no. in, in the prisoner of war camp. But uh, uh, one of our colleagues uh, talked about prisoner of war art, uh, trench art specifically, in a presentation and program last week. And uh, prisoners of war, and it sort of holds true for most trench art. Uh, people made uh, art to pass the time or um, to tell about the time they were experiencing, but then also stuff they could use. So we see things like models and jewelry, but for prisoners of war, they would sometimes make things that would make their lives a bit easier, a crutch or something they could use to you know, scavenge for food or water or supplies. Right. And so that takes us to our first uh, hands-on activity. So what we're going to be doing today, y'all, is uh, we'll be looking at trench art um, uh, through the lens of, like Rob used that word earlier, steam. We're going to be looking at um, some uh, uh, activities and um, some uh, trench art related uh, pieces that uh, you can make uh, in your classroom, uh, uh, at your kitchen table. But all of these are related to uh, trench art or items or activities uh, uh, during World War II. Right. Uh, and Rob is going to show you how you can model some of these activities. And again, the stuff that we uh, have for you guys to, to, to model uh, and to create all correspond to real examples of trench art in World War II, but none of them require uh, any metal smithing or no. soldering irons or exacto <laughs> knives and certainly not, you know, advanced, you know, plans, blueprints or no. schematics. And it's all going to use stuff that you probably can find around your house because that's kind of the spirit of trench art. But it also ties into uh, Earth Day, which is next week. And we all know that making the use of materials that we already have that are going to go to the landfill, you know, that's the second R in reduce, reuse, and recycle is reuse. And so this is a paper plate um, and this is a pencil, obviously. And this goes back to a, a real story from World War II. Um, a guy named Ned Nye, who eventually had a son named Bill Nye, who you've probably heard of. Ned Nye was a prisoner of war um, 
in uh, China. He had uh, been captured on Wake Island and he was really into math and engineering and it was hard for him uh, to know how many days had gone by and stuff like that, but also what time of day it was. He didn't know where exactly he was. And so he was used, he made a sundial. He, his first one, he just simply used a shovel to put in the ground. Uh, and later he used some wood sticks and stuff. And he made the sundial so that as the sun passed over, let's see if this will work, if you can see it. We have studio lights in here, so it makes it harder, mm -hmm. but you can't really see it. You but sure, you can see there the, okay. the, the shadow. So as the sun the, goes the by over the course of a day, it changes the position of the shadow there. And so what you can do is you just need a, a paper plate and a pen and you stick them in there and you might need to put some tape on the bottom to hold it tight, uh, but this one's in pretty tight. And over the course of the day, you just mark uh, where the shadow currently is and, and write, you know, today I would write noon here. And then as the day goes on, you make different marks and you can, you could decorate it or, you know, eventually when you, if you were to buy a sundial for your garden, it would have this stick, it's called a gnomon. It would have it bent at an angle that's equal to your, to your current latitude. Um, and that makes the, the shape even so that all the hours are evenly spaced. So um, Ned and I would have been able to figure out by changing the angle of this until the hours were evenly spaced, he would know what latitude he was at. So he would know more about where he was in China. Um, so that's really cool. And then our exhibit, we do talk about it. So a cool tie in to today is those rovers, those that, that are on Mars, they have sundials on them. They're at, they actually call them solar dials because they're on Mars and not on Earth. But um, it allows the scientists when they're looking at the camera to know what time of day and which direction the rover is pointing. Rob, um, I, had a, I had a question. Um, does it matter what size of, of paper plate or plate uh, no, uh, you use? Uh, it does not. Make this? Nope. So we can also make bigger ones. You could make one in your schoolyard if you wanted to do it as a class project by sticking a, a, a stick, maybe a meter stick or a ruler in the ground and just marking out with stones where it is during the course of the day. And that's another good point, uh, Rob. When they're making their, their sundial, whether they're big or small, uh, are they wanting to keep these inside or they, or they want to look outside? Well, it's going to have to be outside because you want to see the path of the sun moving over the course of the day. And you are going to want to keep it in the same spot because the time will be different if um, you move. So that's why we don't have pocket sundials because, yeah. <laughs> because it would depend on where you were. Like if you traveled during the day, it would change. So time. yeah, and so when it's outside, uh, just, you know, paper plates are you know, not super heavy. Uh, if you want to secure it to the ground using- yep. uh, Some rocks or something. Push, push pins, uh, garden stakes uh, that, you, that you might have around. Yeah. That'll keep it from uh, blowing around. And also make sure you're getting an accurate reading uh, on your time. Yeah, and if you have a school garden, it'd be a cool thing to add in you know, a little homemade sundial. And uh, Rob, just to uh, emphasize again, home. Uh, so this gentleman from World War II who made this piece of trench art, uh, Ned Nye, um, uh, who did, who did his, uh, his son go on to be? His son is Bill Nye, Bill Nye the science guy, who also uh, runs the, the Planetary Society, the Planetary Society. And in that capacity, he designed the the sundials, the solar dials for the Mars rovers. So I don't know, was Ned Nye the science father or science, science father yeah. yeah so he married a woman who came out of the uh uh code breaking so so bill nye had had some very scientific parents going on all right so this is just a shoe box okay we're so, not endorsing any brands no of products no here brands of products at the rational world War II no we don't but this is just a shoe box which you probably have around and what i've done is i've put uh foil at the top and I've put dark paper inside, and this is gonna be a solar oven. I'm covering the cooking area with um, some saran wrap so that um, it will hold the hot air in. Hot air tends to rise, so if you don't put this on there, the hot air might rise out, so it'll heat faster if you kind of enclose it like that. And so you're gonna point this towards the sun and have the aluminum foil top 
reflect the light down into the dark box. The dark color will help absorb the heat. Um, so that's easy to make. You can make this with a pizza box. Um, I don't like using used pizza boxes because they're greasy, but um, but or a shoe box. I mean, probably your family buys shoes, right? So, um, so you can use a shoe box. It's, and again, this is a not super super high tech, but our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, 75, uh, 80 years ago, uh, they're eating uh, and subsisting on. Uh, rations, so uh, not all the time, uh, very appetizing, and more or n more likely than not, not hot. Yeah. So they look for really a lot of times, any way. Yeah, they'd have a can of beans, and they wouldn't have a way to heat it up. Exactly. So uh, anything to make uh, military food a bit more appetizing. Uh, I don't think military food has ever been accused of being, you nope. know, super. Uh, it's good. It keep it keeps you going, <laughs> uh, but it's not nutritious. Very respected, uh, considered high cuisine. No. Nope. So anything to uh, make, Gordon Ramsay would not approve. No, Gordon Ramsay definitely would not approve. But anything to make. Uh, those meals a bit more appetizing. And these solar ovens that were made during World War II, they're still, they're, people still use those yeah. uh, today, don't they, Rob? They do. They do. They use solar ovens and lots of different ways to, to heat your house. So the same principles, people make solar heaters and uh, solar water heaters. The you same can use them to uh, dry and uh, dehydrate things yep. uh, uh, over a long period yep. of time. So this well. is not, so a lot of times solar panels will turn sunlight into electricity. This doesn't, this just uses the heat of the sun. In California, there's a giant heat generator and it's, I don't know if you've ever seen it driving yeah. across the desert and there's all these mirrors in a circle and a big white ball in the middle and they sh all shine onto the ball and it makes steam that generates, turns a turbine. So I have a question. Uh, so if this, we're calling this a solar oven, um, what type of things can we put in it that might, be, we're, we're not gonna be defrosting anything or, or cooking no, a pizza. it would take forever. And around here there, it's really hard because when it's hot, it's usually cloudy. But um, I would, if you wanted to test it out, see how well it worked, you could put in water, a cup of water and just measure how the temperature changed. Mm -hmm. um, you, sometimes I used to use it with students to cook hot dogs. Because they're cooked, they just need to be heated up. Yeah, you know, make sure that you have pre-cooked hot dogs that just need to be heated. S'mores up. too, maybe like a s'mores. You can make s'mores. Melt the because all you need to do is melt the chocolate and the marshmallows. Get them a little warmish. Yeah. So yeah. good for good for that. Not for you know making yeah. Thanksgiving turkey or something. And don't make your Thanksgiving turkey this way. Not no. in a shoebox or, mm -hmm. or or in a pizza box. Nope. Okay, so here those are the two practical things. These are fun. So I like to think of science tricks like magic tricks. Um, so you could put, toy with your friends with these. So I've taken just, these are just tea tins, okay? Um, and I've, one's empty, one's half full of rice and one is full of rice. And I wanna show you what happens. So here's the one that's empty and see how it rolls all the way off the table. Here's the one that's full. What do you think is gonna happen? going to roll and it stops. Okay. And what's going to happen with the half full one? Do you think it's, you probably, you might think that it's going to go farther, but it's going to stop. But look, it's going to surprise you. Even if I hit it, it doesn't want to roll. So what, what is this, this magic or this that you're doing here, Rob? Explain so it's just doing. because of the rice inside the can that people can't see. So obviously if you want to do a, a magic show with your friends, you don't tell them, you know, you make them guess what's inside the cans, but you say like, look at these cans. They're all cool cans. I, they're just, I just put tape on the outside so they look fun. And you just see, you know, they behave differently even though the cans look alike, they behave differently. And it's really strange. It's not what we would think, you know, but what happens is when you lie it down, the rice, goes flat like this, and so it resists your turning it. What's, that, what's that an example of if we're looking friction. for? Friction, it's an example of friction. Example of friction. So friction. all those things in there are moving and every, you know, they, they steal the momentum. So this is taking gravity, gravitational potential energy because it's off the table and turning it into kinetic energy. And that energy in this one, and this is the full one, it's got more of, gravitational potential energy because it weighs more, but it also those 
those uh, rice grains inside are resisting the flow all the time. So they're going to stop it. What if, what would if they don't have a, a, a tea tin like you? Like, you like could a use a coffee can. Um, I was going to use coffee cans, but they're too <laughs> big for this table. setup. They rolled <laughs> clear off the table and you couldn't see what happens. There's another thing you could do, and I'll put this in the instructions when I write them up, is you can take a rubber band you know, through the whole can and put a weight on the middle of it. And when you roll it, it twists up that rubber band and then it'll roll back. It's called a rollback can. And I'll, I'll put the instructions to make rollback cans in the, uh, in the handout as well. Mm -hmm. So I have one last thing to show you. And this uses something that almost certainly is in your house. Almost like all kids, when you're going to school, oh, sure, you have a, a box of cereal in the morning, right? So you eat some cereal for breakfast, or may maybe you got a nice mom who makes pancakes for you every morning. But <laughs> my mom said, you know where the cereal is. So, so what I've done is I've, um, I've got one opened up so you could see. I've just taken toilet paper rolls and cut them in half so that they're just little, little scoops and taped it to the side. So I did in this one, I've taped it to the front and the back so that they're nice and solid. And when you drop the, the ball in, you expect it to go straight down. And there's a hole at this end, right? But the ball goes boom, boom, and shoots out. So it takes a little while to go. The more, you know, the, the more flat your, your little roller coaster is, the longer it'll take to get down. So you're gonna tinker with it to make sure that your ball fits. Um, I was using a larger ball before and it got stuck. So I switched to smaller balls and you can see that they, they go out. So it's sort of like, a, again, like your magic trick of the rollback can, you can yeah. sort of uh, fool, Look, fool your friends and impress, impress, yeah. impress, impress people. Um, you say uh, like, why? Wait a minute, why, why isn't it coming out right away? Um, and this is kind of, I don't know if you've ever played, you know, putt putt miniature golf or something like that. You'll, mm -hmm. you know, maybe hit a, a golf ball and you want a windmill or a, a, a sphinx right. uh, and it comes out in a place you don't uh, reasonably expect. Yeah. Let's get that back on camera so we can see inside of it again. Uh, so if you see inside, you, yeah. you can see the, the toilet paper rollers are there. And then see what it looks like when it's, uh, when it's opened up. Let me show, let me show this to everybody again. And so, so yeah. this is just, it's just here, and I've just taken them, and I've used duct tape. I like to use duct tape; um, has many great uses. And then uh, they 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 cut that open, and they seal it back up with what tape or glue? Yeah, I actually just reached in and did it. So I did. So you didn't. You don't have to. You guys probably have smaller hands than me too, so <laughs> you can reach in and do it more easily. Just put tape on either side, so it's taped in there. And by the way, duct tape is a World War II invention. Tell us, tell us, tell, tell them about it. Uh, duct tape was invented actually by a mom uh, because her sons were complaining about their artillery, their ammunition cases were hard to open. And so she developed this fabric tape. And the cool thing about duct tape is that, you know, it is tough and it twists and stuff, but you can tear it. If you're careful, you can tear it in straight lines. And that's what I've done here. So you can see what's straight, I didn't use scissors. I just good, torn it. That'd be a so good they, future program too, maybe just like looking around your pantry or your your, your what's desk. From World like, War II. What's from World War II? Because yep. uh, even though it's 70, 80 years ago, uh, there are more connections uh, than 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 you would think. Well, yep. Rob, that was some really really cool stuff, and I think some stuff uh, when we upload those instructions that people will be able to uh, uh, to utilize in their classroom or 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 at home. Uh, for learning, but then you yeah, for, for, for some fun too. Yeah, so for Earth Day, you know, I want to see you make some cool things. And um, if you want, you could send pictures of things you made to stem at nationalww2museum.org, or you could make videos, or I believe we have a Flipgrid page where you might be able to add things. Um, and so that would be really cool. You could show us what you did, but just to find ways to spend some cool time, you know, to make something like this, you need to know some stuff. You need to know about gravity and the properties of materials. And then you need to have a creative idea too. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to not buy new stuff for Earth Day. And maybe like over the summer, if you have a little bit of free time, 
this is the kind of stuff you could do then. Yeah, so just like our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines 75, 80 years ago uh, used their surplus time to make some uh, cool things that are still with us uh, using found materials. Just like Rob said, these are not uh, people going off the sh buying things off the mm -hmm. shelf to make. These are people more or less uh, using uh, materials they found on hand to make something of their, of their own choosing. So um, again, we wanted to show off um, a sort of a steam uh, bent on our soldier artist trench art and World War II special exhibit that's downstairs and on exhibit uh, through uh, January 2nd of 2022. So maybe if your class can't take a field trip this year, you could take a field trip next year mm -hmm. or your summer camp could yeah. come by here if you live nearby. And, and if not, you know, maybe it'll travel eventually to your hometown because sure. a lot of our exhibits, when we're done with them, they travel. And just like we said, that trench art isn't new. It didn't stop in World War II either. If you, so if you have relatives who are in the military now or have served anytime, even during peacetime, uh, I bet they, you know, had some, definitely had some downtime and probably made some, some stuff to pass that downtime to yep. make things a bit more interesting. Um, well, we got uh, some time for some questions, everyone. So if you have any questions for Rob or myself, uh, you can put those right in the Q and A uh, uh, Q and A pod, and and we'll we'll have uh, some time to answer those that we can. And in the meantime, let's remind you that in two weeks, mm -hmm. two weeks from, no, just one week. tomorrow, tomorrow on the twenty a week from tomorrow, mm -hmm. we have uh, a talk. Do you remember who it is? Sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it'll be a talk a K through twelve webinar uh, next Thursday uh, on um, uh, Neil Fujita, who is a Japanese American. Uh, who was incarcerated during World War II uh, at Heart Mountain uh, and then served uh, in the military in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team um, and uh, had uh, a brilliant post-war career as a graphic designer, a graphic artist. Uh, he made cover art for, um, for records, uh, LPs, how people used to listen to music uh, and some of us still listen to music. <laughs> uh, but he uh, also had a really, really famous career uh, designing uh, book covers and uh, movie posters, and I bet you've seen some of his uh, some of his work somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's leading up to our in May, May fifteenth, we have a really cool electronic field trip that's mm -hmm. all about Japanese American experience in World War II, mm -hmm. which was a lot about um, the incarceration mm -hmm. in camps of Japanese Americans. And on Facebook, I'm going to be leading uh, on the on Museum Educator Facebook page. I'll be leading a book discussion about um, the graphic novel written by George Takei, mm -hmm. which is called They Called Us Enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an uh, internee. He was young, but he was an internee in the camps. So we've got a few questions that come in, uh, and uh, one I can, I, I can take here, uh, someone asking, um, basically asking the museum generally, where do we get our artifacts from um, that's a, a, a great question. We get them from almost anywhere, from uh, folks who make a very deliberate or specific act of donating them to the museum. They say, I want my mom or dad's or uncle or grandfather's stuff to go somewhere where it'll be safe. That's a museum's job, is to take care of artifacts uh, to tell a story. So people send them to us. Uh, we also uh, um, get things that people find. Uh, if they don't know, they find something when they're cleaning out an attic or a house that someone purchased, they don't know what something is, they'll sometimes reach out to us and, and ask us, hey, what is this and do you want yeah. it? So we've gotten a lot of things you know, somewhat accidentally. And then occasionally, if there's a big hole in the museum's collection, like we really need this and we don't have one, we'll occasionally look to see if we can borrow, that's preferable, um, get something on loan to us, uh, but if not, uh, we'll, we'll uh, purchase something uh, outright. But mostly stuff comes to us in the form of donations. And it can be small things like a button or a shoelace. Uh, it can be a big thing like a, like a plane or a tracked vehicle uh, or a Jeep. Um, there's no such thing as a bad artifact. Anything that can tell you about the time in which that artifact was created uh, is a good artifact. Yep, so um, it was Vesta Stout. Is that Vesta? Mm -hmm. In 1943, oh, uh, she was in Illinois. She worked in an arms plant. And I just didn't remember her name. And she made duct tape so that they could seal the tops of those ammo containers and they could tear it, they would stay sealed, but they could rip it 
to take it off and open them pretty easily. Where's Where's her like a street name, a street or highway named after her, uh, like a like a like a monument or something? She's a should be duct tapes everywhere now. Duct tapes thank everywhere. You, thank you, Vesta. You can um, you make lots of things out of duct tape. What does that say? How did people know the sundial was in the right position mm -hmm. to set the time? Any position, as long as it stays in that position. Um, it doesn't have to be in any particular position. It just has to be able to get the sun and stay there. It's like if you mark it and then you move it, it might not work. Um, yeah, yeah. All you have to have is, again, is like our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine, or like Ned and I, a prisoner of war, is time. So as long as you don't move or adjust your sundial, you'll, you'll have a good reading. Like Rob yeah. said, if the only thing that can make your sundial be in the wrong position is if you change its position. Yep, and actually, interestingly, the Egyptians figured out that the earth was round using sundials because they noticed that the shadow was different um, as they went farther north and south. Rob, we had a question here about, I think your rollback can, uh, just explaining again how uh, the rice inside of it uh, 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 slows it down uh, and doesn't, call it, it doesn't cause it to move. So the rice, um, you know, when you, all the rice is in there, the individual grains move as you as you try to roll it, and as they're moving, they're they're taking the energy, the kinetic energy, and instead of going into moving the can, like with the empty, it has to move the can and all those individual grains of rice. And because they're generating a lot of friction against each mm -hmm. other as they move, it's going to take all that energy and keep it from moving. That's really interesting, and that's a, a great question. Uh, and uh, and uh, you could do the same thing, like if you if you were at home, um, and you have just canned canned food, mm -hmm. you could try. And I would bet that your let's say you have a can of refried beans, mm -hmm. that it would roll because that's pretty solid right. in there. Whereas if you had something sloshy like broth or a brothy soup, mm -hmm. um, that it would we're kind of out of focus. <laughs> um, right. That it would, that it would um, go slower. So um, yeah, so it's just a matter of the material that's in there moving around. There's lots of things you could do. You could take a, if you have those, um, you know those cookie tins you get at Christmas, sure. the round ones. If you put a bunch of washers, glue a bunch of washers around the outside of it, it'll actually go further because it creates more momentum. So we had a question from, from Carol uh, asking, do we have any artifacts related to victory gardens that people made? Uh, not in the, the show uh, downstairs, but we certainly do have them in the museum's yep. collection. Uh, this show, a special exhibit, is focusing on uh, trench art or implements that are made by um, either soldier, sailors, airmen, marines, or prisoners of war. So there's nothing down there made by, uh, uh, by, by American civilians. But we definitely have uh, things from victory gardens or that people made on the home front, uh, again, to pass time or to remember a time in which it was made. And Victory Gardens were, of course, super, super important yes. uh, during World War II in a way that uh, regular Americans who weren't overseas fighting or training or, or serving on the home front, they could, uh, they could contribute to the war effort by uh, you know, making enough food uh, now, to extend now their Now, sometimes rations. in prisoner of war camps or even in... Uh, uh, installations, uh, Americans overseas could grow some of their mm -hmm. own food. Um, they, some guys would take seeds from the tomatoes that they were given or something, and they would try to sprout them and grow their own gardens. Like I said, they weren't necessarily given a ton of food. Uh, that's a good question from, uh, from, uh, I believe, uh, Tina, uh, asking where did most of the trench art come from? Uh, was there more from certain areas? I'm not sure if there's more from certain areas, uh, Hi, Tina. I know Tina. Oh, do you? We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. Answer the question. All right. So uh, where does the most of it come from? So it, it depends. Um, like you could tell, like I didn't take pictures of, we have a whole bunch of coconuts down there that have been painted. You know, so obviously, you know where those came from. Um, not from Germany. Not from Germany. No. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's more, the pattern is more about what was the guy doing in the war. Mm -hmm. Um, so a, a lot of the regular soldiers, just infantrymen, they didn't have a lot of stuff. But the guys that were working in shops, machine shops, or something like that, they had more stuff to make. We have a lot of stuff that's from the prisoners of war. Um, 
but a lot of it didn't hold up because like you said, they didn't have a lot of resources. So, so that violin is really amazing. Yeah, so it's, it's maybe it's the, you know, maybe not from what certain areas are more representative, maybe from different service branches are, are more yep. represented than others. Or, um, uh, but again, yeah, it's, we rely on people, you know, contacting the museum wanting to give us stuff. So there's, there's probably great examples that, you know, are waiting out there that someone has in their, in their family or uh, that has not yet. Somebody once gave me a giant American flag in a duffel bag. <laughs> <laughs> Something walks in, uh, uh, all, all, all the time. Um, Are they all on display? No. No, not everything is on display. We don't have space to put everything on display. But um, so is, I, is all this stuff from our collection, the trench art? Some of the stuff is borrowed, but uh, the vast majority of the artifacts from, from our collection are from the museum's collection. And yeah. But certainly, so that's the job of a curator. That's what curating means is to is to take stuff sort out and make meaning mm -hmm. with a set of things, right? Absolutely, and the uh, uh, cool thing about the curator's job is uh, they also get to put new stuff out on display. We don't have, like Rob said, the space to really prepare or display uh, all the artifacts in our collection safely. So we can take an artifact that's been out on display for uh, a number of uh, you know, months or years, give it a rest, uh, let, it, let, it, let it recuperate, do some conservation work on it, and put something else cool that hasn't been seen yet out in its place. So that's another reason that we love people to come visit the National World War II Museum is even if you've been here recently, uh, I would almost guarantee that you're going to see something, uh, see something new. And if you can't get to us, uh, we're always happy to do more programs like these that we can show off um, cool activities, cool STEAM and STEM activities, but also give you a real look at uh, the museum's collection and some of the artifacts therein. And some of those artifacts, he said, give it a rest. I mean, the paper and the fabric stuff really can get damaged by being in the sunlight. So the curators monitor how long, let's say a uniform has been out and they will trade it in for another one. So yeah, so those, those bracelets, some of them, they would embed a photo covered with resin in it or a stone that they had found or, or something like that that's glued into them. They're, they're really cool. Um, I'll post the pictures too, so you can kind of zoom in on them and see them. Yeah, and just like a, a lot of these pieces probably were made uh, in the field or overseas and probably finished when someone got home. So you hear a lot about of people saving uh, parachutes to make into wedding, wedding dresses, dresses. Uh, for um, a, a, sold, a paratrooper's sweetheart yeah. or, or, or girlfriend when he got home. Uh, probably a lot of that's the case too of people uh, saving, doing some finishing work on, on these artifacts yeah. uh, and pieces probably when they got home. Yeah, he didn't sew that wedding no. dress. No, probably not. <laughs> overseas. Uh, favorite piece of trench art uh, that we have downstairs. I mean, that's the, mine. I mean, the it's violin. hard to argue against the the, the violin. Again, I I, I don't want to uh, undersell the other great pieces that are in this great show that's on display through January second of next year. But yeah, I mean, golly, a guy you know behind bars, surrounded by uh, uh, you know barbed wire rather, and you know guard towers. You know, a lot of a lot of folks probably just you know not do anything or sort of sit there and wait the war out but not 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 the gentleman here watch uh, he, netflix he really really you know put uh, his work in and that's great all right how long was ed nye at pow for uh, almost the entire war he shipped out um and got to wake island uh right before mm -hmm. pearl harbor and then wake island was taken in a in an offensive that was about the same time as Pearl Harbor. So he was captured in December of 1942 and he, he wasn't freed until 1945, I think. So held for a very, very long time. Fascinating yeah. story uh, about you know, uh, people's you know, famous, you know, famous sons, but also what their, what their parents did during the war. Um, I don't know where he made the strings from. Oh, uh, the strings from the violin. I don't know that, uh, uh, Joel. That's a great question uh, for the violin, where they made the strings from uh, for the violin. I'll find out. Uh, I'll ask one of our curators who uh, specializes in our prisoner of war experience here at the museum and see if we can't find that out for you. Um, but uh, otherwise... Um, I think it's time to go. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you can 
do these activities and then come up with some of your own. And like I said, if you come up with some of your own or if you make these activities, we'd love to hear or see about it. So email us at stem at national ww2, the number two museum.org, or hit us up some other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our, you know, Facebook or Twitter, we're active on all those platforms, uh, but we definitely want to hear from teachers and students to see to see the cool ways that they're bringing World War II content into their classroom. It's not just names, places, and dates. Uh, we want to uh, see the cool hands-on stuff and also the cool new ideas uh, that teachers are employing to excite students and the cool stuff students are teaching, teaching their teachers. Yep. So on behalf of myself, Rob, Rob, thank you for showing off with all this cool stuff. Today. It's a lot of fun. Um, we want to thank you for joining us here at the National World War II Museum for today's webinar. Uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube along with uh, instructions on how you can uh, uh, do all of these activities and make all of these things. And we'll post it on the teacher Facebook page. And we'll post it in our K-12 through teacher Facebook group uh, as well. So on behalf of uh, myself, Rob, and all of us here at the National World War II Museum, Thank you for tuning in and we'll talk to you again after a while. All right, thanks.